I'm great. How are you guys doing? Good. Good. Where Good. are we talking to you from? I'm in Arkansas. Okay. You're in Arkansas. Yeah, if I look to my left, there's a lake over there. Great. So, so it's not too uh, bad. You in, look to uh, our summer. left. Yeah, just, just yeah. to our left, there's a white wall. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Just a visually pleasing white wall over there. But thank you for taking the time to talk to me today. Nicholas, Everett, Owen, they're here for Griffin and Summer, which is having its uh, Tribeca premiere. Tonight at 8. That's right. Yeah, tonight at 8. I actually just got done watching it. I thought I was going to be late because of it. I was like, I'm going to finish this like two minutes before I hop on this call. I just finished it at like 12.22 my time. Thank you so much for taking the time. So I, I guess let's get started. Nicholas, what was the inspiration for the film? Well, the inspiration, it is vaguely autobiographical in the sense that I was like Griffin, a kid who spent uh, all of his pubescent years may, directing plays and films out of his parents' basement in a way that was way too ambitious compared to the reality of, you know, being 14, which I think at least with millennials was a common thing, like people putting on plays and then some people like me just took it way too far. And I was reminded of this because during COVID, I digitized those plays and I saw all the humor that I couldn't see at the time of all the playing adults of being 13, 14, 15, and, you know, drawing fake lines on your face and drinking fake martinis and talking about your divorce. And I just became kind of obsessed with that idea of playing adults. And then wondering if the kid at the center of all that, maybe what would happen if he actually met a real adult in the term of in terms of Brad, something adult kind of happened to him. How would this very precocious kid handle that? So that was the initial seed of the idea four years ago. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Well, adults, you know, but when you're 14, someone who's 25 seems, you know, he's a real adult. 60. Yeah. Res- what was it? Griffin types into the computer, responsible adult female. Right. Yeah. Right. That's, that's yes. responsible female adult. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I, I had the same issue at 14. I have a band camp that I hope nobody finds any of that music because it's terrible. Uh, it's okay. awful. Like, I, I, I didn't know how to record stuff and you can't hear the guitar. You can't hear any of the lyrics or anything. Uh, All 14 year old. It, it's still up somewhere. I, I've got to look it up, but yeah, it, it's bad. But yeah, this next question is for Everett. You know, Griffin is this essentially young playwright navigating a really difficult time in his life. So I wanted to ask what aspects of this character did you find most intriguing or challenging? I can't off the top of my head. There weren't specific things that were a struggle for me, but I would say that Mm -hmm. something that me and Griffin have in common is the fact that I used to be, I don't know if I am anymore, maybe I am, I don't know. Someone else will have to tell me, but I used to be very, I, I was, I would, it was easier for me to connect with adults than it was to people my age or, or people sure. like at school. And so I would always like hang out with people older than me, you know, like my best friend in kindergarten was a second grader, which was super ambitious. Um, and so I, that was just something that I kind of took with me when I was thinking, oh, how should I play this, you know? And I recognized that we kind of had that in common. So that was definitely something that I realized the similarity. This next one's for Owen. I want to talk about your character too. Brad is kind of this enigmatic character, especially in his interactions with Griffin. How did you approach portraying his complexities and working back and forth with Everett with that? Yeah, well, I mean, a lot of that relationship sort of developed once we started actually reading stuff together. There was a surprising amount of sensitivity that... Mm -hmm. I ended up finding with him and and Griffin that I wasn't expecting. And I'm not sure how much of that you feel in the movie, because I think some of it was actually me relating to Everett. But I thought it created this nice kind of underlayer of like, okay, Brad is, does, does have, you know, there is a good person inside there who who isn't just a, a, a raging narcissist 
Um, <laughs> it's just buried in layers of self-obsession and, and self-seriousness and, and misery. But Everett brought a lot of that out, you know. But I think the place I started was the physicality and, and the kind of way that he regards himself as like his life is a tragedy and everything is so... He's in so much pain all the time. And, you know, he's really not. But this is how he thinks of himself. So it was fun to play around with that. Yeah. And it really feels like a back and forth where yeah. I think it was a scene where I don't want to spoil too much. So let me know if I'm giving spoilers here where Griffin shares the script with Brad and Brad shares the video with Griffin is more they're talking like artists to each other on yeah. the same almost level, I guess. Yeah. I mean, it, it's funny because like Griffin is this character who's kind of ahead of his years. And then Brad is this character who's kind of behind of his years. You know, he's this 25 year old, but he's really still, I think, kind of adolescent. You know, he he, he hasn't really progressed in the same way. So so Griffin does end up feeling like a peer to him. I think that was, in my opinion, one of the most important scenes because that was like when they exchanged, that was kind of their first connection that they both had and they both experienced with each other because Griffin exchanges his art and Brad exchanges his. Um, yeah. So I think that is a really important scene. And so I think that that's... The turning point in their relationship, first turning point. From that point, Brad is just grunting most of the time and saying one sentence most of the movie. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but going back to Nicholas, I'd like to get into, you know, you talk about it kind of being autobiographical. And I always like asking people about the challenges of making a movie, because I think, as we all know, making a movie is hard. So my question is, what challenges did you face in trying to bring the story to life and how did you overcome them? Yeah, I mean, it was a blessed experience in a ton of ways, but there obviously are lots of challenges. You know, I first started writing the film four years ago when we were still in COVID. And, you know, it really, this film was not a film that came through any labs or anything like that. It really just was for a long time, it was just me in the script. It was that for a couple of years and then trying to find a producer who got excited about it. And that was Juliet Berman. And then uh, trying to find an actor and that was Melanie. And it was just kind of person to person. And this person led to this person led to, it was really a slow build of just assembling a group of people who all felt similarly passionate about the film. And, you know, luckily a couple of those people had money. And that's how we found ourselves making it. But it really was, I don't even know what the term is. And I've been trying to explain it. Um, I don't think grassroots is the right term, but it was really just person to person, slowly putting it together over the course of several years. And then like everything, and then it was very quick. Then suddenly we got a green light and two weeks later we were shooting in August and shot for four weeks and it was over and then editing. And then I thought, you know, Maybe I'd be editing throughout this year. And then it was, we got into Tribeca. So everything got quick again. So it was a lot of quiet and then fast. And, but I'm thrilled with how it all came together. There's, I, I don't know if people have looked at the Tribeca page, but this is a stacked cast as far as I understand. You've got Melanie Lin Linsky, I think is how you say her name. Uh, let me know if I'm wrong on that. That's how yeah. my br brain interprets that name. But and then you've got Owen, of course, and then Abby Ryder Forston, who is amazing. And are you there, God? It's me, Margaret. Criminally underrated last year. I think it won a few awards at our critic ceremony. But yeah, she was great in it. So Griffin, what was it like acting against these two or three really big stars and trying to work off of that dynamic? It was my first leading role and there were so many serious, amazing actors that were kind of there with me. And, you know, Catherine Newton, she's in it as well. So all these actors that have a lot of projects under their belt and have experience and that are really good. And it was just so easy to act against them because they just, they made it fluid and they made it real. And so I think, yeah, I'm just super lucky to be able to have done this with those actors and you know nicholas he had 
the, the best script. It was so easy to interpret how I wanted to play Griffin. And it was just very, it was very easy from everybody because everyone made it really easy. And so I'm just super, super happy that I got to do this. Yeah. I mean, I can't even imagine doing this as your first big I guess, starring role. But yeah, I talked with the filmmaker behind Dirty Towel earlier today. And she talked about a lot of improvisation on that set of uh, yes anding a lot. But yeah, I love the collaboration that a set has. And I think the internet wouldn't let me live it down if I didn't ask. What was it? I know you did Planet of the Apes before this. So sorry for the baity question. But like, what was it like tra transitioning from that into this? Uh, well, yeah, yeah, I don't think Nicholas... Uh, you said that I didn't quite at, at the beginning of the, the film. Dude, I hadn't quite transitioned fully yet. He maybe was a, still a little apish. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's a little bit of species cross contamination, but it kind of worked for the early Brad stuff where he's just grunting and barely saying full sentences. In fact, that's I, actually why I ask because I'm Brad like, is, you know, he's grunting a lot, you yeah. know. Brad I actually might be more ape than than Noah <laughs> Kingdom. I think yeah. yeah. No, it was it, it had been long enough that that I was sort of uh, mostly out of that mode. The physicality of of Brad helped get out of Apeville as well because Brad is very kind of holds himself in a certain way that's very not ape. Yeah, but there was there's still a little bit of holdover. Which was great. We welcome yeah. the eating scene. Oh, the, the eating at scene. The, at the kitchen. Was, yeah. Griffin gives him was the, the alcohol and the <laughs> yeah. salami or whatever. That was, that was total. Yeah. Yeah. But I'm jealous of that scene. Like, it's like a full charcuterie board full of. Oh, like... don't be. It was miserable. <laughs> it was like the first take was fine. The second take was rough. And by the third take, I was fully nauseous. Take six was, yeah. I remember you saying like, oh, I'm not going to spit anything out. And then you ended up having to. Well, yeah, I mean, but I couldn't because for the majority of the thing, I was, like, yeah. you were, you needed me to keep going. Yeah. 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 Just go to the boy meets world school of things where you're just like pushing around things on a plate. Right. But, but anyways, I had to ask. And by the uh, way, I still need to see Kingdom. I still need to see. I know Bad Boys is out this weekend, stuff like that. But yeah, I've been the wanting to see that. Bad yes, the Apes before Bad Boys. Oh, that that would be an interesting double feature, wouldn't it? Uh, but going back to you, Nicholas, I'd love to hear about the script writing process a little bit. I know you briefly touched on that, or I think Everett had briefly touched on the script being so easy to act from, and with this being so involved in, uh, you know, uh, uh, Griffin is making his own script. Uh, I'd love to hear about that. It was an interesting kind of balance in the dynamic of how much of the play, you know, writing about writing can get kind of gross or boring. And it can also be, you know, how much the play is too much. How much do we want to give away? How much do we want to see? And so it was how much does the play parallel real life, blah, blah, blah. So it was, we were constantly finding that balance and things were changing. The script was pretty set, but even in terms of the play, things changed, you know, in the final weeks leading up to shooting. The ending of the play changed in a way that's kind of funny, but they, it, it was always interesting, you know, it, the play is kind of a manifestation of Griffin's, you know, subconscious, like a lot of art is. So it's even the play, I mean, if I go through the, different scenes of the play that I had, different versions of the play. There was a version of the play that had other inappropriate stuff in it. Like there was the, you know, it was about finding that balance of, you know, what's the right level of kind of inappropriate and what's, you know, funny and what's too much. And so that was definitely a journey that through writing and then shooting and then even in the editing room that we still figured out in terms of, there was a lot of things to balance in the film, but that was definitely one of them. Yeah, that's that's great to hear. And uh, yeah, I was wondering about like the cut scenes. I was like, you know, based on a line you hear late in the film of script changes, I'm like, I wonder if that was something that Nicholas put in to just kind of hint at like, here's some things I can't put in this movie, but ha had at one point. Well, somebody mentioned script changes late in the movie. 
Yeah. Who does that? I'm trying to remember. One of Griffin's friends mentions like script. Oh, Pam, yeah. Pam's like, oh, you did. Yeah. Keep rewriting. I honestly, I didn't even realize that there were people have keep saying to me like, oh yeah, the parallels between Griffin's parents' marriage and the marriage in the play was not yeah. even something I was conscious of. I was just like, well, to get Brad in the house, his parents have to be absent. And then the play, I thought that would be funny. And then we leaned into it. But so I'm still learning things about this film. Maybe what you told me is true. I'll watch tonight for it. I guess my last mega question is for anyone who wants to answer is, I had it. What is it like to, or what do you ex- hope ex- audiences to get out of this? And what are you guys seeing at Tribeca? I just hope people think it's funny. <laughs> You know, it's, it, it, it's funny. Somebody else gave that answer. The directors of Fire, F and Fire, was like, yeah, I just hope people laugh. Yeah. No, I mean, there's a lot to take away from it. There's, you know, it's, I think there's a lot about not growing up too fast. There's a lot about learning how to talk to each other and, you know, all that. And also not being like a jerk, you know, to your friends, yeah. maybe. But also like... Bottom line, just I, I hope people think it's hilarious because yeah. I think it is. Yeah, Griffin's a little bit of a jerk. He's a little bit. Sometimes. A little bit, yeah. But I hope it affects people, you know, watching his journey touches people. Yeah. Yeah. But for those watching or listening at home, you can catch Griffin and Summer at Tribeca. I'll have Showtimes and a link to the Showtimes listed in the description of this article. But yeah, uh, Everett, Nicholas, Owen... Thank you so much for taking the time out of what I assume would be a busy schedule to join me. I know Tribeca is always a hectic. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. Bye.